This video will cover sampling distributions in the context of estimating sample means and regression coefficients. By the end of this video, you should feel comfortable explaining what an estimator is, explaining what it means for an estimator to be unbiased, interpreting the meaning of a standard error, inferring the properties of an estimator from its sampling distribution, and drawing a sampling distribution to indicate given properties of an estimator. Think about how you might answer the following two questions. What is the average height of all students at your school? And what is the relationship between height and weight at your school? In principle, you could measure the height and weight of everyone at your school, but this would be quite time consuming. Most likely, you would instead select a sample of students. You could then find the average height for your sample to answer the first question. To answer the second question, you could make a graph of height versus weight for your sample, perhaps fitting a line through your points. In each case, you would be using a sample to make an inference about the population. The population in this case is all students at your school, and the sample is the group of students for whom you collect data. But how well would we be answering each, each question? Would our calculated values from the sample match the values that we would have calculated? How do we collect data from the entire population? And if not, would they at least be close? This idea of statistical inference or estimating parameters about a population from a sample is central to econometrics and to statistics more broadly. A common way to answer these questions is to perform a thought experiment. What if we had selected a different sample? Let's start with the first question. To find the average height, suppose we collected data for the entire population, which we'll assume is 1,000 students. Here is a histogram that shows the distribution of heights in a simulated data set. The average height of 67.969 inches is the population mean. Now suppose that we had instead sampled 10 students at random. Each student could re be represented by a random draw from the population distribution, with the most common heights in the population being the most likely to appear in a sample. In this sample, the heights were 67 inches, 69 inches, 71 inches, and so on. The average of these 10 values, 67.9 inches, is the sample mean. This sample turned out to have a very similar mean to the population. Since we used a sample to estimate a parameter about the population, we say that our sample mean of 67.9 inches is an estimate of the population mean. But if we didn't already know the population mean, how would we know whether our estimate is close? Did we get lucky in this case? Or is a 10-student sample sufficient to estimate the population, population mean height with high precision? This is where the thought experiment comes in. What if we had selected a different sample? Here is a different random sample of 10 students. The sample mean is now 69.4 inches. This is a bit higher than the population mean. By chance, the sample included more students with above average height. Here is a third random sample of 10 students. This sample has a mean height of 66.9 inches. This is a bit below the population mean. By chance, the sample included more students with below average height. In general, we should not be surprised to find the sample mean to be higher or lower than the population mean. Of course, if we only had the resources to collect data on a single sample, how far off from the population mean might our sample mean be? We could get a sense of this by considering how the sample mean varies across many samples. Suppose we drew 100 samples of 10 students, finding the sample mean height in each case. Here is a distribution of those sample means. We call this distribution over repeated samples the sampling distribution. Think for a moment about what this tells us. The center of the distribution appears to be very close to the population mean of 67.969 inches. This is promising because, on average, the mean from a sample will be equal to the population mean. Of course, some samples have relatively high means, while others have relatively low means. A good way to describe how far our sample mean could be from the population mean is to measure the width of the distribution. There are various ways to measure width, but a common one is the standard deviation. The standard deviation of this distribution is 0.83 inches. To give you a visual idea of the meaning of a standard error, the length of the red arrow is roughly two standard deviations, one on each side of the population mean. 
The standard deviation of a sampling distribution is also called a standard error. So the standard error gives us an idea how far off a given sample mean might be from the population mean. To be a bit more precise, you might note that this distribution looks similar to a normal distribution. We will see later that this distribution is very close to normal, but it is not quite the same. You might also recall that a random draw from a normal distribution is within one standard deviation of the mean 68% of the time. This means that a given 10 student sample has a roughly 68% chance of having a mean height within 0.83 inches of the population mean height. For this reason, you might think of the standard error as a measure of the precision of an estimate. It may be worth distinguishing the sampling distribution from the distribution of height in the population. You might notice that they have similar means but different widths. It is not surprising that they have similar means. We noted earlier that we hope the sample means match the population mean on average. What does the width of the height distribution tell us? Like any distribution, we could measure the standard deviation, which in this case is 2.78 inches. What does this value mean? The heights of the individual students tend to vary by this amount. Or, if the distribution were approximately normal, then 68% of students have heights that are within 2.78 inches of the average. Both values may be useful, but they tell us very different things. The standard deviation of heights tells us the variation in heights of individuals, while the standard deviation of sample means, or the standard error, tells us the precision of a sample estimate. Why is the sampling distribution narrower? Each sample is likely to contain some individuals who are above average height and other individuals who are below average height. When we average over multiple individuals, we are likely to get a value closer to the population mean. Another important difference between the two distributions is that we usually don't see the sampling distribution as it's uncommon to have more than one sample. For this reason, econometricians and statisticians find ways to estimate the standard error using only one sample of data. In fact, you may recall from a previous course that an estimate of the standard error of a sample mean is the standard deviation of that variable divided by the square root of the sample size you could plug in the values to see that this estimate is a fairly good one in this case. There are also comparable formulas for standard errors of other parameter estimates, as we'll see shortly. Let's now return to the second question we posed. What is the relationship between height and weight? Hopefully this strikes you as a question where regression analysis would be appropriate. If we regress weight on height, the parameters beta1 and beta2 would describe this relationship. For instance, beta 2 would tell us the additional weight associated with each additional inch of height. The ordinary least squares procedure for estimating beta 2 is an estimator, just as the sample mean was an estimator for the population mean. The broad ideas we have just discussed about sampling distributions also apply to estimating parameters in a linear regression. Let's take a closer look. If we had data on height and weight for the entire population, we could use a regression to obtain the population relationship between these variables. In this case, we find a slope of 6.31, so that one extra inch in height is associated with an additional 6.31 pounds in weight. More realistically, we will have data only on a sample. In one such sample of 10 students, the best fit line has a slope of 5.59. Apparently in this sample, the magnitude of the relationship between weight and height is smaller than in the population. Just as a given sample may lead us to over or underestimate the population's average height, it could lead us to over or underestimate other population parameters, including the slope beta 2 in the weight versus height model. If we draw another sample of 10 students, the estimated slope may differ. We could continue to draw samples estimating the slope parameter in each case. If we recorded each of the slope estimates on a histogram, shown on the right, we would get an idea what the sampling distribution for beta 2 looks like. Here is that sampling distribution for 100 samples of 10 students. Let's study the distribution for a moment, paying attention to the same two features as in the previous sampling distribution, the center and the width of the distribution. The center of the distribution is visually quite close to the population parameter, which we know to be 6.31. This suggests that the OLS estimator is unbiased. 
That is, even though the OLS estimate of the slope for a given sample may be higher or lower than the population parameter, those estimates are correct on average. Second, the width of the distribution tells us something about how far from the population parameter a given estimate might be. Analogous to the standard error of a mean, the standard error of a coefficient, equal to the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, quantifies this potential error in estimating the slope. As before, we may think of the standard error as a measure of precision, with a lower standard error indicating greater precision. The standard error, as measured from the 100 samples, is 1.96. Assuming the distribution is approximately normal, this means that roughly 68% of the samples would result in an OLS slope estimate that is within 1.96 of the true population parameter. While well, visualizing these sampling distributions is a useful way of understanding the meaning of a standard error, this exploration should not hide a sobering fact. In most analyses, we have a single sample, not 100 samples, with a known population parameter for comparison. This means that we can estimate a single value for a parameter. Even if we are confident that our estimator is unbiased, we can't be certain whether the population parameter, the number we're trying to estimate, is lower or higher than our estimate. In fact, with only an estimate, we'd have no idea how far the population parameter might be. Given this reality, it would be especially useful to supplement the estimate with a standard error. This would allow us at least to place some bounds on the likely values of the true population parameter. For instance, we might say from this single sample that we think there must be at least some relationship between height and weight. If not, the population parameter beta 2 would be 0. But in that case, it would be very unlikely that our sample would produce a slope estimate of 5.59 which is nearly three standard deviations above the population parameter. We will formalize this idea when we discuss hypothesis testing, but hopefully it is clear that the standard error is essential for making such, such statements about statistical confidence. Fortunately, we can estimate the standard error from a single sample. We will discuss this formula more in the future, but the value is easily calculated by software packages such as Stata. Now it's your turn to try two exercises. First, Suppose you make the sampling distribution for the average height shown on the, at the bottom right. Note that this smooth curve shows the frequency of means across repeated samples just as a discrete histogram does. Suppose you also learn from medical records that the average height for all students is 66.3 inches. Based on this information, can you identify the population mean of height? Also, what can you say about your method for estimating the mean height? You may wish to pause the video for a moment while you answer this, these questions. Let's look at the first question. Although we often don't know the population mean in advance, we have a source of data on all students, the medical records. Presumably these records contain accurate data on the entire population, so the population mean height is 66.3 inches. For the second question, take a look at the sampling distribution. The population mean height of 66.3 inches is approximately here. This is at the edge of the sampling distribution, indicating that very few samples had means that were close to the population mean. In fact, the center of the sampling distribution is several inches to the right. The sample means uh, consistently overestimated the population mean. This suggests something went wrong. Perhaps self-reported height tends to be too high, or maybe our method of sampling individuals for the survey tended to lead us to taller individuals. For example, if many of our friends are on the basketball team and we sampled them. Whatever the reason, we see that our estimator is biased. We might also specify that it is a positive or upward bias because our estimates are consistently higher than the true population parameter. Let's try one more exercise. Suppose we know the value of a population parameter beta 2 is equal to 3. Draw the sampling distributions for the estimators described here, all in the same graph. You may wish to pause the video again while you work through the exercise. First, an unbiased estimator is correct on average. That is, the estimates of beta 2 should equal the population parameter 3 on average. 
even if some samples produce higher estimates while others produce lower estimates. We can represent this with a bell-shaped curve that is centered at 3. Second, an unbiased estimator with a larger standard error has a wider sampling distribution. It is still centered at 3, but the distribution is shorter in the middle and higher on the ends. This means that samples are less likely to have estimates that are very close to 3 and more likely to have estimates that are a bit farther from 3. Third, a bias estimator is consistently wrong. That is, we would systematically over or underestimate the population parameter. Here is one possible sampling distribution for a bias estimator. This particular estimator would be negatively or downward biased because the sample estimates are lower than 3 more often than not.